Good afternoon and welcome to my lecture for Philosophy 3200 on jury nullification. This is a little bit of background about jury duty. As you know, citizens are forced to serve on juries when the government conducts jury trials. This occurs for both criminal and civil cases. So you might have to evaluate the guilt or innocence of an accused criminal, or you might have to evaluate the merits of a lawsuit. You'll probably be called for this at least several times in your life. Uh, most of the time when you get called, they wind up not needing you or you get excluded from the jury for one reason or another. But you'll probably wind up serving on a jury at least once in your life. You may get a nominal payment, something like $50 per day. Uh, it probably won't make the whole thing worth it. Uh, but your employer has to let you go and uh, serve on the jury. Now the basis for this lies in the United States Constitution in the Bill of Rights. The Sixth Amendment reads, in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, etc., etc. Also, the Seventh Amendment says, in suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved etc. So that applies to both criminal cases and civil cases. Now jury nullification is a phenomenon in which a jury will vote to acquit in spite of clear evidence that the defendant violated the law. Now there could be also something like this in civil cases where the jury would defy the law or defy the instructions of the judge about the law uh, because uh, they don't agree with it, or they think that uh, the interests of justice lie elsewhere. Now, judges and prosecutors typically hate this practice. They will tell you not to do it. Uh, the judge may instruct you that you can't do it, and uh, that is false. Uh, you can do it, but they may falsely tell you that you can't. You may have to promise not to do it, so a judge will likely exclude you from a jury if you don't promise to simply apply the law as explained to you by the judge. Now, uh, this gives rise to a tip about how to get out of jury service if you're trying to do that, as many people try to do. If you just mention jury nullification in the process of jury selection, you'll probably be excluded. However, you should not do that because uh, you should be willing to to help determine um, the requirements of justice in a particular case, because there's a very good chance that um, you know, justice will be miscarried. Uh, lawyers are not allowed to mention the possibility of jury nullification in a trial. So if the defense lawyer tries to mention this possibility, the judge will shut him up and possibly sanction him. Nevertheless, in spite of this, it is still legally valid. And what I mean by legally valid is, so first of all, there's no law against jury nullification. There's no law that says that a jury has to vote based upon the actual law or based upon the objective evidence about whether the defendant did what he's accused of. Also, no one can overturn the jury's decision. So even if it becomes completely clear after the trial that the jury did a nullification vote, even if everyone on the jury says that that's what they did, it is not a basis for appeal. The prosecution cannot appeal that decision. It can't be overturned. They can't try the person again. Uh, the, the jury's decision stands as being the, the legally accepted outcome. Also, the jury cannot be punished for their vote, uh, even if it turns out to be a nullification vote, even if they disregarded the law in doing that. Okay, now I'm going to talk about arguments for and against this practice. Uh, is this a good thing to do? And here's the basic argument for jury nullification. So first, as a general matter, it's prima facie wrong to cause someone to suffer unjust harm. Now, I don't have very much to say about why this is true, because this just seems to me kind of tautological. I don't know how somebody could be in favor of causing unjust harm. Notice, by the way, that I'm not saying that it's always wrong to harm someone. I'm just saying it's prima facie wrong to harm someone unjustly. And there couldn't really be an argument in favor of unjust harm. Now, maybe you might think there are some special circumstances in which maybe it's okay to cause unjust harm to one person to prevent much worse things from happening to someone else. That is why there's a qualification in there that says prima facie wrong. 
So what that does is essentially I'm saying it's wrong to do this unless there's a good enough reason. There has to be a good enough reason for causing an unjust harm to outweigh the rights of the individual. Here's a second premise. Being punished under an unjust law is suffering an unjust harm. And that again seems pretty close to a tautology. Punishment is, by, ne by definition, at least aimed at harming people, and it's really not controversial that the state's punishments are typically harmful. Being sent to jail or even getting a fine is a form of harm. Also, if the law under which a person is being punished is unjust, then it seems like, by definition, the harm that you suffer but for being punished under that law is an unjust harm. Third, convicting a person under an unjust law causes them to be punished under that law. That is true in virtually all cases, you know, assuming the defendant doesn't escape before he gets sent to prison or something like that, um, obviously he is going to wind up being punished. So the conclusion is it's prima facie wrong to convict a person under an unjust law. And so the conclusion here is if you're on a jury and the law under which the defendant is being tried is an unjust law, then at least on the face of it, you should vote to acquit, even if the person did in fact violate that law. Okay, now I have a hypothetical example that illustrates this. So imagine that you and a friend of yours who happens to be gay are walking down the street and you run into this gang of hoodlums and the hoodlums ask if your friend is gay and suppose the context is such that it's clear that they plan to beat him up if you say that he's gay. What should you do in this circumstance? Okay, but in fact the friend is gay and you know that. So what should you do? Should you like say, I cannot tell a lie, he is indeed gay, and then watch your friend get beaten up? Obviously not. Obviously what you should do is lie. Just say, no, he's completely straight. You know, he has three girlfriends and whatever, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now uh, this is not a difficult question. It's true that lying is usually wrong, but hoodlums do not have a right to know the sexual orientation of people on the street. So there's really like there's there's really no controversy about this case. Now this is analogous to the case of if you're a jury serving on a trial and the law under which the defendant is being tried is an unjust law. The state is like the hoodlums because the state is threatening to inflict unjust harm on someone, namely the defendant, and they're asking you a question, did this person violate this law? And if you answer yes, then they then you know that they are going to proceed to inflict this serious unjust harm on this person. So in the same way that you should lie to the hoodlums, you should obviously lie to the state. Just say, no, he didn't do it. And then you know that they're going to let him go free. Okay, now you might wonder um, how you can go about doing jury nullification, because during the process of jury selection, uh, if you haven't been through this, you may not know this, but during the process of jury selection, you're basically, before you're seated on the jury, going to be asked to promise not to do jury nullification. They will not use that term. They won't even use the word jury nullification, but they will ask you to promise something like that you will apply the law as given to you by the judge, uh, that you will only look at the factual evidence in the case and whether the defendant actually violated the law that he's accused of violating or something like that. Uh, they might ask you whether there's anything that would um, prevent you from voting for a conviction if the defendant is shown beyond a reasonable doubt to have committed the crime or something like that. Uh, if you refuse to take this promise, then you'll be excluded from the jury, and that's 100% predictable. So how can you even get in a position to do jury nullification? How does this even continue to happen? And basically the answer is that you should make the promise. You should make the promise in order to get seated on the jury. And then after you're on the jury, during the deliberations, then you should think about whether the law is just or unjust. And if you, if you conclude that the law itself is unjust, then you should change your mind and go back on the promise that you made to the judge. 
and at that point uh, it will be too late right after after you've already made the jury nullification vote it will be too late to exclude you from the jury and the defendant will either go free or it'll be a hung jury and they'll have to redo the trial uh, also a bit of advice uh, if this actually happens to you during the course of jury nullifications you should come up with reasons for distrusting the factual evidence you should look for at least some reasons why the defendant might not actually have done the thing and the reason is that there's a court case in which uh, somebody was um, excluded from the jury and replaced with an alternate during the course of deliberations because he was advocating for jury nullification and then that that case got appealed and in the appeal um, the court decided that it was an error to exclude that person because his sole reason for voting to acquit was not jury nullification because he had some arguments about the evidence not being sufficient to convict uh, and so uh, if that's the case then a an appeals if if this happens in your case an appeals court judge will say um, that you can't be excluded uh, if some of your doubts have to do with the factual evidence okay and why should you do this why would anyone want to do this thing uh, you know defying what the judge wants and so on and um, the answer is basically if you're if you're in the jury selection process and there's a particular defendant that's before the court it is almost certain that that defendant is going to be convicted if you personally don't get on the jury the reason for that is that just around you know 90 percent of all trials lead to conviction so therefore you should you should expect a 90% probability that that particular individual will be convicted if you personally are not on the jury. However, you also know that you personally have the power to at least deadlock the jury. You can at least prevent a conviction uh, which may result in a mistrial and the government will have to redo the trial uh, or possibly you might be able to convince other jurors to acquit. Okay, now you might think, um, oh, but you know, it's wrong to make a false promise. But if you, if you bought the earlier example about how you should lie to the gay bashing gang, and analogously, you should lie to the government when they're asking you a question that they're obviously going to use as a pretext for inflicting unjust harm on someone, uh, if the lie is justified in that case, obviously also making a false promise is justified. That is, it's justified to say that you're going to do something immoral and then not do it if that's the only way of preventing someone from inflicting a serious unjust harm on another person. Okay, now I'm going to talk about the arguments against jury nullification. So there are a series of arguments. As I mentioned, um, judges tend to be extremely hostile to the idea of jury nullification. Not all of them, but a good number of them are extremely hostile towards it. And sometimes they give their explanation of why they think that it's wrong. Uh, sometimes they're popular editorial, sometimes they are like law review articles, and sometimes it's just in a judge's decision in a particular case. And so these arguments are drawn from those sources. The first thing that is heard is uh, sometimes they say jury nullification violates the juror's oath. This is the oath that the judge himself will have forced the, the jury members to take before being seated on the jury. All right, and that's true factually. It's true that there will be this oath in almost all courts in the United States. And it's true that if you do the nullification vote, then you'll be breaking that promise. But note that nobody in moral philosophy thinks that it's always wrong to break a promise. It is usually wrong to break a promise, but there are cases in which it's justified. One of these cases is it's justified to break a promise in general in order to prevent harm to innocent other people that is much greater than the harm caused by breaking the promise. For example, say that you promise to pick your friend up at the airport, but while you're on the way to the airport, you come upon an accident victim who needs to be taken to the hospital immediately. So you stop and you take the accident victim to the hospital, which stops you from picking up your friend at the airport. So you've broken a promise, but that's clearly justified because it prevents a much worse harm to the accident victim.
Okay, now this is similar to the case where you break your promise to the state to help to enforce its laws because that's necessary to prevent a much greater unjust harm against a defendant who's going to be sent to jail for violating an unjust law. And note that being sent to jail is an extremely serious harm. Um, it is, you know, probably being sent to jail is worse than being beaten up, right? You could lose years of your life living in about the worst place that anyone in our society has to live. You could wind up being beaten up while you're in jail, wind up being abused and so on. Once you get out of jail, there's this stigma which may prevent you from getting a job and so on. So it's actually a very serious matter. Somebody gets to get sent to jail and no one should be sent to jail without a really good reason. Here's a second principle about when you can break a promise. Uh, you can break a promise when breaking the promise is necessary to prevent the promisee from committing a serious wrong. So uh, that does, so that is similar to the previous principle, but the point here is uh, the person that you made a promise to, if that person is threatening to commit a wrong, a wrongful action, and the only way to stop them from committing the wrong is to break your promise to them, then that's completely justified. And you don't even have to show that the harm that you're preventing is much greater than the harm to the promisee because uh, they don't have a justified complaint. When you break the promise to them, they don't have a justified complaint because it's their own wrongful behavior or threatened wrongful behavior that's forcing you to break the promise. For example, suppose that I, I offer to lend my rifle to someone on the weekend, and then before I give it to them, they inform me that they plan to commit a few murders with the rifle. So then I break my promise to them and I don't lend them the rifle. That's justified and they don't have a complaint because it's their fault that I had to break the promise. Similarly, when you make a promise to the government and then you break the promise in order to prevent the government from committing an injustice, the government doesn't have any legitimate complaint about that because it's their fault that you had to break the promise. Here's the third principle. Uh, it's okay to break a promise when the promise was extracted by a threat of coercion, including coercion against innocent third parties, as well as coercion against you yourself. For example, let's say that somebody threatens to shoot your neighbor unless you promise to pay him, the criminal, $1,000. What you should do is make that promise and, and then as soon as your neighbor is safe, call the police and get that person arrested. And then after they're arrested, do not give them the $1,000. You don't have to keep your promise to that person because it was a coerced promise. That is, they forced you to make the promise under the threat of committing unjust physical harm against your neighbor. And so that's not a binding promise, right? A promise has to be made voluntarily without a threat of unjust harm. Okay, and this is analogous to the situation of a jury member who uh, is, is required to promise that they're going to help to enforce the law. And they have to do this in order to forestall a threat of unjust coercion by the state. That is, um, essentially, if you want to prevent unjust harm from befalling a criminal defendant, you're forced to make this promise. Right, and so um, that is not a, it's not a voluntary promise. It's a coerced promise, coerced by the state. Okay, here's the second argument that's given against jury nullification. Sometimes it's said that the jury is not responsible for the punishment, the state is responsible. So you might think that uh, for this reason, you don't have to, um, the jury doesn't have to evaluate the justice of the law. The jury's job is just to evaluate whether somebody actually violated the law. They're not responsible because they're not actually telling the state what the law should be. They're not telling the state to punish this person. They're just telling the state this person, as a matter of fact, committed this action. But this isn't really a plausible argument. Return to the example of the gay bashing gang. So imagine that after you tell the gang about how your friend is gay and they beat him up and then you go and visit him in the hospital and you explain to him that you weren't responsible for him being beaten up it was the gang because you know you didn't want them to do that you just told them the fact you just gave them the factual information that he was gay 
that he was gay and you didn't actually tell them to beat him up, although you knew that that was going to happen. This would really be a hollow defense. You wouldn't really be able to say that you were completely not responsible. Obviously, the gang is primarily responsible, but you have to have some responsibility since you could have easily prevented this uh, negative outcome. Okay, here's another argument. Uh, it's very common for the opponents of jury nullification to describe jury nullification as, quote, lawless behavior. Now, I'm not sure exactly what's meant by this, but uh, one interpretation is, you know, maybe they mean that it's actually illegal, actually against the law. Now, that is just, as an objective matter of fact, false. There just simply is no such law. There's no statute. There's no case law. Uh, the case law suggests that this is a power that the jury has, right? So if you do the jury nullification vote, it's completely uncontroversial that that's a valid verdict, that it can't be overturned, you can't be punished for it, etc. Here's a second interpretation. Well, it's lawless in the sense that you know, it prevents the law from being consistently enforced. So that's true, but that can't really be given as an objection to jury nullification because that's really just a restatement of the central point of it. People who are advocating for jury nullification, exactly what they're trying to accomplish is preventing certain laws, unjust laws, from being enforced. So it's not really an objection to say, oh, but then not all the laws will be enforced. Okay, here's another thing that's sometimes said. Um, the problem might be that jury nullification makes trial outcomes unpredictable and dependent on subjective judgment. And we need a system where the outcomes are predictable based upon the objective written law. Now, in response, I would point out that there is actually a lot of unpredictability in the justice system already, and nobody thinks that the other sources of unpredictability are a major problem. So for example, there's something called prosecutorial discretion. This is the, the fact that the prosecutor in a particular jurisdiction has discretion as to what charges to file and what cases to pursue at all. The prosecutor is not required to prosecute a case even if he thinks he has enough evidence to do so. A prosecutor can decide that it's not in the interest of justice to prosecute a particular person for a particular crime that they could prosecute for. So there's that bit of subjective judgment and therefore there's unpredictability where different prosecutors would make different decisions. There's also discretion on the part of police. The police do not legally have to arrest someone even if they have evidence that the person committed a crime, even if they have enough evidence. The police could decide that it's not worth their time or it's not in the interest of justice or you know, they could decide to give the person a break, just give them a warning or something like that. So again, there's the subjective judgment and the unpredictability. Also, judges have a lot of discretion in the conduct of trials. There are a lot of things where different judges will make different decisions. And so, uh, and there's also uh, subjective judgment on the part of the jury about factual questions. So the jury is supposed to judge whether the factual evidence is, quote, beyond a reasonable doubt. But that's an extremely subjective judgment. It's unpredictable how that will come out, so different juries will make different judgments about what constitutes a reasonable doubt and so on. So these are all ways in which there's a lot of unpredictability and a lot of subjective judgment in the justice system. And yet nobody thinks that that ruins the system. So it doesn't really make sense that just this one exercise of subjective judgment and unpredictability is some kind of disaster for the justice system. Uh, it's not clear how the subjective judgment involved in the jury deciding whether the law is just or unjust is particularly worse or makes things particularly less predictable than all of these other sources of unpredictability. Okay, a second point to make is that a small increase in predictability doesn't really outweigh the duty of doing justice to the individual in a particular case. The main task of a trial is to do justice to the specific individuals who are in that case. The task of a trial is not to make social policy or to send messages to the rest of the society. It's just to do justice to those individuals who are before the court at that time. That is their main responsibility. And the idea of increasing the predictability of trial outcomes 
in society in general doesn't really have a, an important role in that. So for example, say that you're in a case where the factual evidence is controversial. So suppose that you think that the factual evidence in the case does not rise beyond a reasonable doubt. Suppose, however, also that you think that the majority of other juries would consider it to be beyond a reasonable doubt. Never mind why that's the case, just assume that that's your judgment and you know that's what you think about what other people's judgment would be. So question, should you vote to convict on the grounds that that would make trial outcomes more predictable, right? In other words, um, because if you vote to acquit, then you're going to be acting in the way that's less predictable, right? Because most juries would have voted to convict. So should you vote to convict so that jury outcomes will be more uniform and predictable and so that your judgment will match that of other people? This is uncontroversial, right? No one thinks that you should convict in that case. Everyone thinks that you should follow your own judgment about what is or isn't beyond a reasonable doubt. Right? And so what that shows is that this goal of trying to make outcomes more predictable does not outweigh the importance of doing justice to the individual by your own lights, that that's your responsibility. Okay, now finally, note that having uniform injustice isn't superior to having a mix of justice and injustice. Now in general, maybe non-uniformity and unpredictability are bad, but for example, suppose that you have this gay bashing gang and you think that they've beaten up a lot of other people. They've beaten up a lot of other gay people in the community. Should you tell them that your friend is gay so that they can beat him up so that there will be increased predictability? So the answer to that is obviously no. It's not better to have predictable injustice, to have everyone uniformly be treated unjustly rather than having only some people be treated unjustly. Okay, here's another argument that's sometimes made. It's sometimes said that, you know, you as an individual jury, not, jury member don't really know what's right and wrong or what justice does or does not require. Now this was suggested in the article by Robert Bork as part of his explanation for why you should just defer to the law. Okay, now the problem with this is that if you think that individual jury members in general don't know what is right or wrong, then why would the people who made the laws know what was right or wrong either? This only makes sense if you assume that elected politicians have much better moral knowledge than the rest of society, but there's really no reason to think that. Anyway, it's clearly false that in general you don't know what's right or wrong. At least sometimes you know that something is right or wrong. At least sometimes you know something is unjust. Like for example, I know that slavery is unjust. Therefore, I know that a law that was enforcing slavery would be unjust. So that is why, for example, during the 1800s, uh, it was justified for a jury to acquit somebody in a trial under the fugitive slave laws. It's not the case that nobody knew whether that was just or unjust. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that jury nullification is always justified. I'm just saying that sometimes it's justified because sometimes you know that the law is unjust and if that happens, then you should vote to acquit. Now, here's another thing that you might think. You might think, you know, maybe the democratic process is just more reliable than the judgment of a jury. So in this objection, we're not saying that people in general don't have any moral knowledge. This objection would be granting that in general, people have some moral knowledge. It's just that when you aggregate the judgments of lots of people in the way that the democratic process does, that's more reliable than if you just rely on 12 randomly chosen people from the community, right? The 12 people might not be representative and you could easily have cases where the 12 people have kind of idiosyncratic opinions. And so maybe <coughs> the opinion of the majority of society is more reliable. The problem with this is actually the democratic process is highly unreliable at coming to correct and just conclusions. One of the reasons for this is voters, as well as politicians, are very frequently ignorant of relevant information. Uh, they're also very frequently unreasonable. Uh, in fact, they frequently do not try very hard to figure out what is just or unjust. 
And this point is this is part of why I was making a point in a previous lecture about how the system isn't even really aimed at justice. The process by which we come to many of the laws frequently just doesn't take into account obvious and very important justice based considerations. Also, voters and politicians are frequently motivated by self-interest, so they very well may not be pursuing justice, and they very well may have uh, incorrect, unjust laws. That is completely plausible. But also, more importantly, the voters and the politicians who make a law don't know the facts of the individual case that's before you, the jury, at a particular time. And frequently, there are facts of a particular case that make it different from other cases that are relevant to what justice does or doesn't require. Uh, because the legislature can't anticipate all of the particular facts, all of the particular situations that might occur, they're not really in a position to reliably say, you know, some universal rule that is going to cover every case, right? Juries, on the other hand, are reasonably reliable. Voters are frequently very unreasonable and, and frequently don't have relevant information, but juries are usually conscientious and they sit there listening to the evidence presented by expert advocates. They sit there listening for hours because they know that their decision is going to determine the outcome for this particular individual. And each jury member can have an influence. It's very plausible that a single jury member can change the outcome of the trial in a way that's totally implausible that one voter will change the outcome of an election. That's why juries pay attention during the trial. So that makes it much more likely that the jury is going to make a correct, just decision. Okay, now I'm only saying that a jury should vote to nullify if they are in fact justified in believing that the law is wrong or unjust. I'm not saying that they should always vote to nullify, but there are at least some cases in which that happens. There are at least some cases in which you're going to look at the situation and say, well, it would not be just for this person to be punished under this law. Okay, now sometimes people object to jury nullification by just kind of listing examples of situations in which jury nullification would be morally wrong and in which it might in fact have happened. So it is said that in America's more racist past, uh, there used to be cases where a racist jury would acquit a hate criminal, basically because they were sympathetic to the hate crime. Right, and so obviously in that case, jury nullification was unjustified. But this doesn't really make an argument for the conclusion that you personally should not vote to nullify if you find an unjust law. Notice that the existence of wrongful cases of some type of action doesn't mean that no one should ever do it. So for example, most lies are unjustified, right? Most of the time in human history, when somebody's told a lie, it was wrong for them to do that. But it doesn't follow from this that you should never lie. There obviously can be cases in which you're justified in lying. You're not justified in lying most of the time, but sometimes you could be justified. And the fact that other people have done it for bad reasons doesn't automatically mean that your reasons in any given case are bad reasons. Right? It's also obviously not the case that there's no way of distinguishing between better and worse reasons. Obviously, voting to acquit because you're a racist and you know the defendant committed a crime against a group that you hate is a bad reason. But that doesn't mean that there aren't any good reasons for voting to nullify a law. Okay, so that was all discussion of the kind of moral philosophy issue about what an individual jury member morally ought to do. Now I'm going to turn to kind of a legal theory question, which is what legally speaking is the function of a jury? Why did the framers of the US Constitution include this right to a jury trial in the Sixth Amendment? Now you could think about different things that might be the function of the jury. Uh, there are basically three things that might be you might think is the jury's function or is at least somebody's function in the course of a trial. First, maybe the function of the jury is just to figure out the facts, right? Figure out who did what. And maybe a jury is the best way of doing that and the framers realize that and that's why they included the right to trial by jury. The problem is that there just simply is no reason to believe that. 
there's no reason why a jury of, of 12 randomly selected people would be better at figuring out just the descriptive facts about a case than a professional judge. The judges would obviously be better at figuring out the facts because, first of all, judges on the whole are going to be more intelligent than the average member of society. So if you take 12 just average members of the community, typically they're going to be much less intelligent than the judge. They're also typically going to be much less educated on average than the judge. And finally, and most importantly, the judge is going to have a lot of experience. The judge is going to have seen a lot of criminal cases. And so he's going to kind of know how things work. For example, if there's DNA evidence in a trial, the judge is going to understand that evidence. He will have seen that kind of thing before. And average members of the community may simply not understand it. They may have never seen DNA evidence before. They may know nothing about it. So they could be much more easily misled. So there really isn't any reason for thinking that you need a jury if you just want to find out the descriptive facts about a case. Here's a second thought. You know, maybe you just need the jury because they're good at applying laws. Uh, so that is figuring out what a law implies about a particular situation. Uh, basically, nobody thinks this, and there's no reason to think this either, so I'm not going to spend time talking about that. Um, obviously, juries are going to be less good than judges at figuring out how a law applies to a particular situation. There's only one final function that I can think of that might be the function of the jury where you might think that they're better at this, and that is exercising value judgments. The juries are not better at knowing facts about cases. They're not better at knowing the law, but you could think that they're, plausibly, you could think that they're better at making moral value judgments. And so this is probably the concern that the framers of the Constitution had, namely that the government may diverge from the values of the community. And in such a situation, the judges in the judicial branch of the government cannot be trusted to remedy this situation. They will tend to share the same biases as the rest of the government. The judges will be appointed by the other branches of the government, so they may be appointed by the governor of a state or by the president if it's a federal court. Uh, and so they're very likely to share the same kind of like elite politician values and uh, to side with the government in the case where the government diverges from the values of the rest of the community. That's why you would want to pick a jury of 12 ordinary people, because this, this random selection of 12 ordinary people is going to represent the values of the community. But notice that if that's the rationale for the importance of jury trial, that inherently requires that you accept jury nullification. It's that the jury can be a check on the government by refusing to enforce laws that they consider to be wrong. Now, these are some quotations from founders of the United States government that uh, support what I'm saying about the function of the jury trial. OK, so as a little bit of background, the Federalist Papers, as you probably know, Federalist Papers were written to defend the new Constitution before it was adopted. And there was a debate about whether to adopt the current Constitution. Um, these seri this series of essays was written by Hamilton, Madison, and Jay uh, in order to explain the rationale for the Constitution. So this is from Federalist 83, which was written by Alexander Hamilton. They say, the friends and adversaries of the plan of the convention, that refers to the coming constitutional convention where they were going to decide on ratifying the Constitution. So the friends and adversaries of the plan of the convention, if they agree in nothing else, concur at least in the value they set upon the trial by jury. Or if there is any difference between them, it consists in this. The former regarded as a valuable safeguard to liberty, the latter represented as the very palladium of free government. It would be altogether superfluous to examine how much more merit it may be entitled to as a defense against the oppressions of an hereditary monarch than as a barrier to the tyranny of popular magistrates in popular government. 
And what this is illustrating is that the trial by jury was regarded and widely regarded at the time. So Hamilton could take this for granted and represent as something that virtually everyone was agreed upon. Uh, it was regarded as a safeguard against tyranny. Here's a quotation from John Jay. John Jay was one of the other authors of the Federalist Papers. He was also the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. And he said this in the only jury trial that the Supreme Court um, has ever held. This was the case of Georgia versus Brailsford decided in 1794. And so John Jay gave the instructions to the jury in that case. And this is what he said. It may not be amiss here, gentlemen, to remind you of the good old rule that on questions of fact, it is the province of the jury. On questions of law, it is the province of the court to decide. Now, so, so far, it sounds like um, he's going to be against jury nullification, but then you read the next sentence. But it must be observed that by the same law which recognizes this reasonable distribution of jurisdiction, you have nevertheless a right to take upon yourselves to judge of both and to determine the law as well as the fact in controversy. On this and on every other occasion, however, we have no doubt that you will pay that respect which is due to the opinion of the court. For as on the one hand, it is presumed that juries are the best judges of facts, it is on the other hand presumable that the court are the best judges of the law, but still both objects are lawfully within your power of decision. All right, so there Jay is suggesting that uh, he thinks that he and the other judges are better at judging the law, but he's very clear that he thinks the jury has the legal right to evaluate the law. Okay, this quotation is from another one of America's founders, John Adams. In 1771, he was discussing uh, a possible case in which a juror disagrees with a judge. And Adams says about the juror, it is not only his right, but his duty to find the verdict according to his own best understanding, judgment, and conscience, though in direct opposition to the direction of the court. Notice, by the way, how this strongly clashes with the views of Robert Bork discussed in the previous lecture, where Bork was saying you should not exercise your conscience and should just follow what the authority figures tell you. The founders of the US Constitution generally had the opposite views. And finally, this is from Thomas Jefferson. And here, this was in a letter where he was discussing his reservations about the French Revolution. He says, another apprehension is that a majority cannot be induced to adopt the trial by jury. And I consider that as the only anchor ever yet imagined by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. And now notice how all of these comments about the importance of the trial by jury, about how it, it helps to hold the government to its constitution, or it's a check on tyranny, none of those things make sense if the, if the job of the jury is just to follow the instructions of the judge. How would it then be a check against tyranny? How would it then hold the, the government to the principles of its constitution? These comments only make sense if the framers were contemplating that the jury would use their own moral judgment and that they would potentially defy the instructions of a judge or defy the law that the government had made. And so therefore, the judges who are opposing jury nullification and who instruct juries that they can't do it, it's those judges who are actually defying the law and substituting their own moral opinions for the law. Because the US Constitution is uh, uncontroversially the supreme law of the land. And these comments from the, from the founders and the authors of the Constitution make it clear what the purpose of the trial by jury was. And so judges who are trying to prevent jury nullification are actually working to undermine the system as it was designed, exactly the opposite of what they're claiming. So in conclusion, jury nullification is both a moral and a legal responsibility in our system.